I'm part of uh, several different starfish organizations, and that's why I want to talk to you about it. Not because it's the best way to organize, not by any means. Um, every organization model, centralized or decentralized, has its uses. Um, what I merely aim to do today is point out the differences and um, to bring, bring to your attention that there are these new ways of organizing, especially for millennials. And if you consider millennials, which is um, by far the biggest group of people at the moment, uh, we should be planning the future according to their needs, right? I mean, that stands to reason. So in my experience, and I count myself as a late millennial as well, um, I, I feel like this kind of organize, organization model resonates better with the young people nowadays. Young people don't necessarily want to be led from above from a hierarchical perspective, so which leads to better results when, when you advocate voluntarism. So you invite people um, to participate rather than try to give people orders and tell them what to do. And while this may work in a centralized organization where, where there's a set goal, you want to do a very specific job, then oftentimes it can be uh, beneficial to have this kind of uh, centralized uh, predator like we see here. Um, so, so the spider is very efficient. It can hunt um, insects, other smaller beasts, and uh, it's a, it can be quite dangerous. But if you introduce any, any kind of danger to it, it will centralize, make itself even... Uh, more centralized target to attack. So a very different thing indeed when you're talking about uh, starfish. As you can see, if you look from afar, you might, might see some similarities. You might actually mistake them for insects or, or um, maybe they are uh, small spiders as well. But uh, that's pretty much the extent of the similarity they have. They have these prongs, these legs coming out. But what happens um, when you cut out, for example, a leg from the spider. Well, it might not kill the spider, probably won't, but it will severely um, impair its ability to hunt prey. It won't be as efficient as it used to be. Whereas if you cut out an um, arm or a leg or whatever you call it from a starfish, uh, the leg grows to another starfish and the starfish itself may grow another even longer leg, which is if you go to Google and check uh, starfish, that's actually what they do. So they are just like this organic matter, cell matter, that you can just split any which way you want and it will just keep growing. So you, if you attack this kind of system, um, this is what happens. So you will have multiple starfish to deal with. Whereas if you go after the, let's say the CEO of a company and you cut the head out, the chances are that you are going to kill the actual company. So. Again, this, I stress this is not to say that centralized um, companies are bad by any means. You just need to be aware of the trade-offs that you're making. What are the trade-offs of this kind of resilient system? Is Of course, it's not as fast, as efficient in many, many things. Like, let's take example Bitcoin, okay? This is the, the by far, in my opinion, uh, the, the currently the only actual application, everyday application for blockchain technology. Well, if you attack Bitcoin, you would have to take, uh, you, have, you would have to put up, up a big upfront cost, and, and um, it won't be even uh, feasible to actually control the network because there's always a possibility when somebody takes, uh, let's say that a big miner comes to the market and wants to corner the market and, and gets more miners and that tries to centralize the system, there's immediately an incentive formed on the other side for somebody else to build up business and, and fill the competition void. So in free market, uh, this kind of uh, resilience can be something very useful in a protocol level money, for example, that you, you want to ha have a very robust protocol layer of safety. So th this is where a Starfish organization comes to uh, mind because it's quite resilient. And if you want to go after it, you would have to go after the whole ideology and in the Bitcoin's case, the ideology is freedom, which is uh, pretty darn hard to kill. So I, I would like to give you an example. Actually, the whole inspiration for this speech comes from this book that is also named Starfish and Spider. I highly, highly recommend you all read it. It's quite an easy and fast read, and it will uh, outline it much better than I could ever, ever do this. 
Um, but there was very, very good example that resonated with me about Apache Indians and the conquistadors. And what conquistadors did, they, they, went, they were conquerors, right, by the name. They went to a place, they, they cut off the head of the leader, they conquered, they took the gold, and uh, that's how they expanded. What happened when they encountered a starfish organization, which was the Apache Indians, that were not led by a king, not led by a you know, god king or whatever, a, a centralized person that has put themselves on the pedestal and then um, divulges orders. Once you bribe that person or cut the head off, then you will control the whole nation. However, the Apaches didn't work this way. They worked as small tribes, circles, that moved fast, and they always had this, uh, what they called Nantans, chiefs, that would be leaders, but they would be leaders by choice, by, by the community. The community would choose to follow um, these certain individuals because, well, what they did seemed to work well. So they were playing a game, okay, let's stick with this guy, maybe he's bigger, maybe he can hunt better, I don't know, maybe he can protect us. And once they cut off uh, the head of the Nantan, there will be another one sprouting up because the ideology of the Apache Indians were to be free. They didn't want to um, they didn't have any other agenda except to stay alive and, and live a happy life. So that's a very interesting thing. And how did they actually manage to uh, win after all? because there is a way to, to kill this kind of an, um, starfish organization as well. And what did they, they did was kind of go after the ideal. So what they did, they gave these chiefs cattle, okay? So suddenly they had property. So it became a um, position of wealth, and they, they mixed that with the leadership, which led to corruption, which led to the, to the decay of the whole society, and then that's how they were, were eventually uh, weeded out. But uh, it goes to show that it takes a lot of effort, a lot of uh, cleverness to actually kill this kind of starfish organization. It won't take much which, which to go after a company CEO. And this is something uh, I would like everybody to keep in mind. If you're having a blockchain project and you claim that it's uh, decentralized, well, what most of the times is meant is distrib distributed, which is a different thing. It's quite a hard thing to conceive a decentralized system from, from zero, like Satoshi did, what, what, what he did with the, what they did with the, with Bitcoin protocol. Because how would you conceive, um, how, how would you um, program something so revolutionary without actually making yourself public? So this is my biggest problem with a lot of projects that claim to be decentralized. Well, then who are you? Who are you telling me that this is a decentralized system? Who are you selling me this product? Okay, so there's clearly this kind of a hierarchical old world system. There's a funnel that you're trying to funnel something through a very narrow uh, portal, and you are the portal, and you're going to benefit from that. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's all good and fine. Nothing wrong with making money, nothing wrong with business. I want to make that clear. But decentralization, very hard to achieve, very hard to um, fabricate, let's say that. You need organic, some, something to grow, some, an idea that is planted so deep in, uh, in the hearts and the heads of um, humankind, like, like freedom, the yearning for freedom that we all have. So once that starts to resonate, and I do believe that it's resonating within the millennials, we will see, I believe firmly, very different organization structures in the future. Now, uh, spider organizations are obviously not going to go away anytime soon. They still have uses, and I have outlined here a little bit of uh, polarizing because it's always uh, easy to polarize. I'm um, good to polarize thing to make it a little bit easier to understand. So here's a couple of things that, um, if you look at leadership in an organization, right? You have an authoritarian um, king, CEO type of um, you know my way or the highway kind of leader, which can work. And on the other hand, we have a we have a peer. We have a peer that is uh, actually not giving orders, but working al alongside with everybody. So leading by example, leading from, from the front, not leading from behind like a, like a um, slave lord, so to speak. So, so this can resonate with a lot of, lot of different personalities, and it can work with a lot of, like, let's say, voluntary organizations in general, like consensus is, is kind of like a, okay, for sure, I'm, I'm on the paper, I'm the chairman, but that, what does that actually mean? 
you know, I'm, I'm here just as like everybody else doing the work and, and leading by example. And, and um, you know, we are still living in a world that is defined by these hier hierarchies. That doesn't mean that we can't do better. We can always try to do better. And that's also one reason why, why I'm stepping down from the, from the chairman position, because I feel like we, it's, uh, we need to see if the ideology is strong enough without any strong leader. And, and if the ideology is not strong enough, then I, I also firmly believe that it, it doesn't deserve, deserve to be. It needs to be um, replaced with, by something. But if we don't try, then how would we know? So the boss, uh, there's uh, strict control. Normally the CEO wants to have all the all, um, strings in their hands, control, full control of everything, whereas the catalyst doesn't really care if people show up to work. Um, he's there anyway. He's going to be pulling the, uh, his weight. He's not expecting anything from anybody. Everybody shows up uh, because they want to, and that's precisely the strength of a decentralized organization, a Starfish organization, because everybody's there because they want to be. They wake up in the morning, oh, I want to do this, and they go do this. And if you associate yourself with people like that, you know, in my experience, there's really no limit what you can accomplish because you will always find people raised to the occasion when you treat them the best as a pos best possible person as they could be, people tend to raise to the occasion. So I think, um, yes, we have baggage. We are all brainwashed to this um, one way of thinking. And while this can work, in many occasions it does work, maybe it's time we take a look, um, hard look at this option also as a serious way of organizing individuals. Like, um, I'm going to give you a brief example in the end of my presentation about a couple of uh, projects that I'm part of. So to go a little bit more into the good parts, the bottom line. So what, what you can accomplish with a uh, spider organization is rapid decision making, which is often what, for example, Bitcoin is um, blamed for, or it, it's uh, sometimes brought out as a bad thing, that it takes a long time to update the protocol. Somehow it's seen that it's, it's inefficient, which it is. However, there's a good reason why you don't mess up with uh, protocol level money because it's quite an important thing for quite a many people. So I would like that the developers take the proper care and time, all the time they need. So definitely for rapid changes, go with the spider one because if, if you want to do something fast, efficient right now, I, I don't think you can accomplish. You can if you, if you get the right team and you get lucky, but normally it's just you have the vision and it's like, Okay, shut up. Now, you do this, you do this, you do this. Okay, it's very efficient. It's done, right? And it can be good. Um, so you can accomplish some things for sure faster. But if you're looking at the long term, um, what I care more about is, is this person going to work with me in the future? You know, every transaction, every human transaction you do, every, every um, word you share is a transaction that you're betting on the future of which will you be doing business or work with this person again. So this is the, the way I, I think about it. Uh, so I talk about syndication. So we have these syndicates of um, like-minded people. Maybe they all have their own companies. Like, for example, we have this uh, collective called Blockfish. You can check it out on blockfish.co. Uh, we are still on stealth. We're not public yet. But we are develop developing uh, blockchain solutions. And the idea is that Blockfish itself, it's not going to be a centralized point of like uh, funneling funds. Sure, it will take a cut, like let's say 10, 15%. Point is that everybody who brings in new clients will get the majority of the client's um, revenue. But everybody can work on these clients. So everybody wins by being a part of uh, the Blockfish syndicate. And that way, the person who brings in the client will still benefit the most. So he doesn't necessarily have the incentive to go, go about it by himself because then you can hedge on others. Like maybe you have a bad day, maybe you have a bad week. Um, somebody else brings a client, great. You, you get a small cut, even better. Like it doesn't matter. It will even out in the long run. So uh, get yourself some work. In the future, 
I dare to say that we are not going to experience more jobs. We are going to experience much, much less jobs and job security. We won't have this kind of world where you go to university, you get a degree, you go to work, and then you work for 40 years, and that's not going to happen anymore, I don't think. I think we need to find, for uh, the millennials need to find um, small streams of passive income. And I, I think this kind of thing, uh, Starfish organizations can be key to that because you can be a part of um, several different organizations and get a little bit trickle down in income from here and there. So this could be a, a great way to hedge for the future as well. And of course, uh, lean, fat, uh, flat, nimble, not fat, lean, uh, means nothing extra. Like you don't have a high overhead. That's like the, the biggest competitive edge a Starfish organization can have for a spider organization. Spider organization has, often has a headquarters, maybe a second headquarters even. Uh, they have um, pay payroll, they have steady employees, you have to worry about a lot of costs, taxes, whatever. When you have a Starfish organization, you don't have almost any of those. At least everybody is uh, responsible for their own expenses. So you get very, very lean um, uh, structure for your expenses. So this is actually, in my opinion, even better than making money, you know, spending less, right? This is what we're talking about here, digital sound money. So we finally have a way um, to actually store our, the fruits of our work for later use. And this is funny, the book I mentioned earlier, it was written one year before a Bitcoin white paper was written, which is interesting because the book tells pretty much the story of Bitcoin um, from start to finish as a decentralized organization. So it's very interesting to see that it actually has played out perfectly, the, the whole theory of a decentralized organization being uh, resilient. Almost everything I have told you has become true with Bitcoin. If you look back, what happened from Bitcoin 2009 to this date started as an experiment. And then more and more people got in because some people were doing it. They were followers. And then there were more followers. The idea, the, the seed was planted and the virus is spreading right now. And that's what we are experiencing when we, when we hear like blockchain, Bitcoin, blah, 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 drugs, whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is the virus is spreading. It doesn't matter what people talk. They talk. It's too late. You, you cannot stop um, the virus from spreading anymore. So what you can do is join it and try to build something together. So... Starfish organization, in my humble opinion, is a way to accomplish absolutely anything if you have enough time. <laughs> so it's all about attitude. And then you will find the right, uh, the correct people will find you. Let's, let's put it that way. So here's to wrap up the actual presentation with a couple of examples. Probably uh, many names you already know. Probably some names that you wouldn't think that started as a Starfish organization, like Skype, for example, which is now owned by Microsoft. But it goes to say that immense value has been created by, by this method. Um, if you look at Craigslist, Craigslist, for example, how popular, well, in Finland, I don't think it was ever that popular, but in the, in the US, for sure it was. Pirate Bay, I'm, I'm sure everybody remembers that, still, still there. By the way, a great example of a decentralized system that is not even that decentralized, and yet it couldn't be killed. It's still not killed. I mean, we know the industry tried to kill a Pirate Bay for many occasions, and it's not even, I don't think it's even that hard of an ideology to attack. It's, all, it's kind of like a milder version of the Bitcoin. It's the same agenda, freedom, you know, freedom of information, freedom of, you know, all this uh, piracy and uh, property laws. Actually, this is probably a good time for a couple of questions, if you have any. Go ahead. <coughs> yeah, so I think religions are a good example of Starfish organizations. Agreed, yes. That's why Quakers is, uh, is one, uh, one there. And I think, I think Mormons are also uh, a good example. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I've been, I wrote a blog post about uh, the, how do you say, like the, Link between uh, religions and and, uh, and uh, cryptocurrencies or money is you know, and, and so what you do like tell what's your opinion is that, like how much how much of the uh, value of the cryptocurrencies for example like Bitcoin is based on similar faith than uh, people have in, uh, in 
let's say Jesus or Allah or something like hmm. that. It's an interesting question. Well, let's, let's first define how we assign value to anything. It's all about faith, right? It's just a matter of who you put the faith in. And that's precisely the point. Um, I mean, do you really think the banknotes in your pocket have some in intrinsic value? I mean, sure, the paper value. But, you know, we used to joke that uh, which one in 10 years, which one will be more uh, valuable, one dollar bill or uh, a square of toilet paper. And we came to the conclusion, it's got to be the $1 bill because you can wash it and use it again. But <laughs> this is a <laughs> uh, how to assign value because we believe so. We assign value. We want to use Bitcoin so it has value, right? It's that simple. Supply and demand. What, what we have now in the fiat system is that we have a bank guarantee, which means absolutely nothing. It can be broken at any time, and it has been broken many times. You have hyperinflation. Look at Venezuela, for example, where people are actually using Bitcoin to save their lives and their families' lives. Well, what's to say that that doesn't happen here one day? I wouldn't be so sure. But to answer your question, definitely, I would say 100% faith. I mean, you have to have faith in something. And what I have faith is open source software. Starfish organizations, um, open source code. While I'm not a technical person myself, I'm a generalist, I, I can trust that there's enough people, smart people in the world, who have looked at the code and said, it's okay, it's fine. I can trust that because it's open source. If it was closed source, which, which is uh, like, for example, Apple and most of the you know, the spider organization software is, you don't know what is there. You don't know what kind of backdoors are there. So if you have a system that is open to everybody, then you, you can have a degree of trust even if you don't understand it yourself, even if you can't read it. And this is, I think, what, where we're headed. Like, t t the same with the internet protocol. For example, uh, TCP IP protocol. I, I, I doubt that most people here know how that actually works, but it's the basis of how you use internet, how you use social media, and everybody can use that nowadays. And I think the same thing is going to happen with cryptocurrencies. It might not be Bitcoin. Certainly now it is Bitcoin. But uh, while, while I um, classify myself as Bitcoin maximalist, actually I'm just a freedom maximalist. So I'm uh, protocol agnostic. So show me a better protocol and I'll convert. More questions? So I'll take your questions now. Please. So, I mean, I raise this because there's been debate in Finland about this difference between blockchains and cryptocurrencies. Um, we'll say that they can be blockchains without cryptocurrencies. And, uh, my claim has been that you cannot have a public blockchain without a cryptocurrency. What's your thinking about the difference between building your own blockchain versus participating in the internet of value which is out there already? Well, that, that's an excellent question. This actually polarizes perfectly the Starfish and the Spider organizations. Like, I, I often compare the blockchain, and, and there are blockchains, there are private blockchains, there is such a thing. I'm, I'm not of that school that, of thought that thinks that the only blockchain is Bitcoin blockchain. Obviously, it's not true, but it's the most useful blockchain. That, that much I agree. Um, oh, I lost my train of thought there. What was the question again? Yeah, so... so the difference between private and public, and you know, and the, uh, the necessity of cryptocurrencies and blockchains. Right. So, uh, I don't think it's necessary for corporate blockchains. Like, it's it's like the internet compared to the internet, right? And the internet is immensely useful for everybody. Internet is only useful for very select few. Okay. So this is an important distinction. Like, um, you, you can have many many good applications, centralized applications that work perfectly fine for what they're intended to. But if you want to have a sovereign, independent money, you got to have a public immutable ledger that nobody can, absolutely nobody can touch. That's the baseline. you you got to have that. If you can't have that, then you are going to have a centralized system, which can be fine. It can be fine, but it, it won't be a replacement for the real thing if we're talking about digital sound money here. 
and that's not to say that all these other projects don't have value. They, they for sure. Like, let's say uh, we, we have, we're talking about tokenization, we're talking about security tokens, utility tokens. Yeah, I, I do believe in the future we will have this uh, coexisting. But I do also think that we will have a base protocol level money that we defer to, and we swap our uh, utility tokens and stuff through that. And at the moment, I feel it's, uh, strongly, I feel it's Bitcoin. And I struggle to see how it will be replaced because of the ne immense network effects Bitcoin has at the moment and the developer support. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, I think uh, there needs to be this uh, level of awareness on, uh, specifically in, in the Finnish tech scene. Because I constantly get in my social media post this comment that, hey, but blockchain and, and cryptocurrency are completely different things. They don't need to come together. Uh, well, I want to make this point that you cannot have a public blockchain without the cryptocurrency. Oh, and of course. It, of course. And, the, and the argument for this is very simple. If you ha want to have a network of computers that anybody can participate in any in any way in the world, and that, that, that network of computers is providing resources to something, uh, somebody needs to pay for this. I mean, let's say that you want to have a database, worldwide database for patents, or whatever other IPR you want to put on the blockchain and you want to make it worldwide, and you want to make it available to anyone to participate. The problem is that, that uh, you will run out of volunteers for a lot of causes, you know, if you ask people to donate their resources without anything, uh, anything coming back to them. Uh, so now, then the next question is, that who is going to pay for this? And you know, if you have this question, who is going to pay for this? Um, uh, if somebody is paying for all of those computer resources, that person owns that network. Because they can any time uh, shut down the cash flow, and you know, and then the network is gone. Well, and, that, that, and, and this yeah. is exactly why the right. cryptocurrency is so important because it's algorithmically generated for the purposes of any, enabling anyone to participate at their own way. Yeah, I agree most most of that. What I don't agree with is is that um, the miners don't run the show, though. I mean, it might seem that the miners run the show, but for example, if you look at B B cash fork, Bitcoin cash fork that happened a year ago, and then what they tried to do with the Segwit 2x fork, didn't really work. Even though they had the majority of the miner support, the users decided other way. So this is what is in play in a decentralized organization. It's something called the NAS equilibrium, where everybody plays the game, and it's not beneficial for them to change their strategy. They want to keep playing this game the same way because everybody benefits. So uh, if you disturb this balance, then somebody's going to get hurt. And this time it was the miners. Uh, they got hev pretty heavily hurt in the, in the Bcash uh, debacle. And that's what happens when you try to centralize Bitcoin, when you try to introduce these uh, elements of centralization to a very resilient system. Great question. <laughs> Please. Yeah, from the back. Uh, can can you get her a microphone because I can't really hear. Yeah, yeah, it should work. Yeah, just uh, pop it on. Okay, so the concept of fully decentralized world is amazing, of course, especially if you want to bank and bank people and give the access to the global economy to emerging markets. It sounds amazing, of course. Uh, but, <laughs> there is always but. There's always a but. Uh, yes, uh, so how about the regulations? Always you will find the bad people. You need anti-money laundry policy, you need KYC. So end of the day, you need a centralization. You need to have a people responsible for fraudulent transaction. You need to have a people who actually control what is happening. So how do you see that? Um, I resent that a little bit. I don't think we need a centralized authority to tell us what is okay. We do need regulation, and we have regulation. It's called self-regulation. It's called, like I mentioned, social ostracism. We don't deal with dicks. Excuse me, my language. But, you know, it's everybody's personal choice, who you work with, who you associate yourself with, right? And if you work with shady people and you feel like you need protection from them, maybe you shouldn't be working with them in the first place. I don't know. It's just a thought. I don't think that we need a centralized uh, authority to tell us that it's okay. We need the society to take collective personal responsibility on everything. Yeah, but you know, if you work with the company in Latin America, it's really difficult to check who actually owns it, what is the shareholders. Right, yeah, I agree, but I, I don't think KYC is necessary, in my opinion. Well, so you really believe in the people, that's nice. I believe in people, yes. 
Uh, as a follow-up question to that one, in Starfish organization or decentralized organization, how do you deal with uh, conflict? Excellent, excellent question. Uh, conflicts are very important. Uh, what we have in consensus, uh, we, we call it the constructive disagreement, and that's um, I wouldn't say it's the end goal necessarily, but that's kind of like where it always goes to because we are people, we have our opinions, we never agree fully on anything. So it's more like finding the way, finding the shelling point where we disagree the less, least. Okay, so um, yeah, very, very good question. I think it's very immensely important to disagree with people. The, you know, like patting yourself in the back and, you know, telling your, each other that you're, you're a great guy and yeah, that's, that feels good sometimes, but you know, you need some friction to actually spark some ideas. I, I, I do believe so. Good question. Yes. Spiders usually hunt by themselves. But how the starfish are doing? Are they in a crowd and see if well? That's interesting. I, I, think, <laughs> I think it would be at least closer to. I, I'm not an, a matter expert on starfish or, or spiders, but it stands to reason that, uh, yeah, I, think, I do think spiders hunt alone. That's a great metaphor. I need to. Uh, see how starfish hunt because they have to eat somehow as well. But I, I would imagine they are laying in the seabed, kind of like minding their own business, which is also a fitting metaphor. Yeah, that's nice. I need to, for the next presentation, I need to tap into that. That's really good. Please, more questions. Yes. Okay, one more about the technology. So uh, you're talking all the time about the blockchain, and this is the, the, the best technology. Can you tell me why you don't think that, for example, Hashgraph, which is a thousand times more efficient, like we can make a 24,000 transaction per second on Hashgraph, 10, trans 10 transactions per second on blockchain, or maybe Tangle, which also is way more efficient than blockchain. So what do you think about those different technologies which evolved? That's a great question. I, I, came, I came late, sorry. <laughs> um, I wanted to go back to... Hold on. Right, so yeah, you can achieve greater degree of efficiency for sure uh, with a centralized organization if, if that's what you're looking for. It's if uh, transaction speed is all you're looking for, by all means, have your own shitcoin and have it have the big, uh, fastest uh, transaction speed on the planet, you know, faster than Dogecoin even. Uh, but, you know, if, what, what are you trying to do? Like, um, Hashgraph is an interesting project. Uh, t t the same way as different blockchains. I'm interested in those, um, but I, they're, they're not like um, at the same level at the moment. They are experimental technologies, whereas Bitcoin blockchain is a functional uh, technology that has a use case. So I, I, I would say to your question, it's quite easy. I mean, interesting to see where the development takes us. However, at this point, I don't see it ver very useful to have a, a competition between, um, uh, against Visa or PayPal or the likes, because that's not really an uh, improvement of, uh, to anything that we have, right? I mean, we should try to improve our lives. Yes. Um, I agree with her in the sense that, uh, that uh, we do need blockchains for different purposes. So uh, I think we do need a blockchain that competes with Visa and MasterCard because they are gatekeepers. They are basically like controlling, controlling all the money flows on the planet. They're basically profiting from everybody's transactions. Uh, I do think that we need blockchain-based solutions that are replacing them. However, uh, like you're saying, uh, Bitcoin is one of those those uh, like like uh, blockchains that solve one problem. I mean, in this case, it's. I, I think the problem right now is uh, like being some kind of digital value storage, um, and then you need still a blockchain for other things like IoT. You know, like machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication. Bitcoin is definitely not good for that because it's just too heavy for this. Yeah, like you need, you need to have a much more lightweight protocol that doesn't try to do anything else. That's just Making a tiny bit of communication between uh, nodes and you know, having as, as distributed system as possible without any mining systems at all. That's and, then, and that's where the hash graph kind of things are the digital, uh, I mean, the direct basically graphs are very, very good at. But then you also have platforms like Stellar. I mean, I'm of course not <coughs> familiar with that platform because, because our token runs on it. Uh, but it's basically a ripple for everybody else. You know, ripple is a centralized system, and everybody knows that. You know, it's basically. I think it's security, really, like right. the whole, whole like yeah, everything else. Yeah, but uh, but uh, uh, Stellar tries to do these fast transactions and, and, and uh, lightweight fast transactions between between parties uh, with uh, blockchain based uh, solutions, and uh, it works fantastically. You know, I've been using it now for quite some time, and you know, it, it does solve a problem. 
So I think I think there is a place for these kind of things, which is different use case from Bitcoin. I think I think yeah, we just like have to say that okay, this one solution is here, and then there's another one, and then another one. Right. right. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. It's just a, in my opinion, is uh, distinguish between want and need. You know, do we have this need? Do we have this hair on fire problem that we need to solve? And what, what, what is the transaction speed going to solve right now? I mean, I, Internet of Things, obviously, Bitcoin is not suitable for that. I agree fully. But then again, we don't really have this kind of Internet of Things, artificial intelligence network yet. What do we need, need that to you know, ex extinguish our thirst for, actually? But we, what we do have, in my opinion, we do have a need for a better money because well, I don't know if you guys agree, but uh, it's, it seems to be a sort of a consensus that we are doing pretty badly in, in, a, in a global economy. So people are looking for he ways to hedge their wealth and, you know, hedge for the instability. So I, I feel like we have an actual hair on fire problem in our, in our hands that needs to be solved first. Um, well, I mean, there's over billions of unpacked people on the planet, so there is need for payments, for sure. That is outside the because and you can't deny that. You can Oh, I don't, I'm not denying that. No, I agree with you. It's just about the prioritization. I, and I, I do think that if you, if you have a sound base layer protocol money, it will be beneficial, especially for the, for the less fortunate people in the world. I do believe that. Do we have... All right. Um, sorry, no more time for questions. You will find me uh, all throughout the day here, and you can also find me on Telegram. And please, let's keep... Talking about this, this is immensely uh, important and interesting topic for me, and uh, I'm not going to take time anymore. Thank you.